Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for another day to serve you, to know you, to love you, and be loved by you. We ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit would be here with us today to open our minds, to understand what you would have us to understand, to open our ears that we might hear, to open our hearts that we might be soft before you. I ask, Father, your blessing on Doris as she shares. Give her the words that you would have her speak. Let not one of them fall to the ground. And, Father, I ask that you would just anoint her to, to share the things that you have shown her, the things that you have placed in her heart and her mind. I ask, Father, for your blessing over this day. Father, we, may we live it to honor you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have your little order of events, uh, on the order of events, I am supposed to greet you. Greetings. I'm supposed to pray, and I have devotional comments. So I thought maybe I would just kind of read scripture, because I'm, really I'm not really a daily bread kind of guy. Um, if you have your Bible, open to Galatians chapter 2. Uh, there's just some scripture that I want to share with you today. Uh, as I was listening last night, there were things that God has been working in me and, and building in me. And, and last night, some of these things came very clear to me. Um, so thank you for the speakers that spoke last night. Um, you blessed me. Uh, I, I heard you say you're not a public speaker. Um, if you were a public speaker, you wouldn't need God. You could do it in your own strength. And so I, I fully empathize with that, um, I, uh, I was probably close to my 30s before I ever talked to people, and God called me to the ministry when I was six. Okay, I wasn't even a Christian yet. My mom wasn't a Christian yet. Um, so God, uh, I, I would much rather have someone who feels like they are not gifted in this area and trust entirely on God to do it. So in Galatians, uh, first Galatians is an amazing book. Uh, Galatians to me is Romans light. Uh, not that it's got less value, it just uses a significantly lot less words. Um, but in the book of Galatians, uh, Paul is talking about how we are saved, how we are justified, and he's contrasting uh, faith and works. And there's a couple of passages here. I'm just going to read one section, and then we're going to bounce to a couple other uh, scriptures real quick. Um, in uh, Galatians chapter 2, starting in verse 15, uh, Paul, uh, now keep in mind the audience that Paul is speaking to is uh, a group of churches in the region of Galatia. Um, it's, uh, Galatia was not a city, it was an area in Asia Minor, and he's speaking to a number of churches in that area. That church, those churches were predominantly made of Gentiles, con constituted of Gentiles, very minority of Jews, but predominantly Gentiles. So Paul writing, he says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. What an amazing statement. And, and, and while, you know, we, in, in our discussions last night, we talked about uh, the root, root of polygamy in a moral argument is that that this is what justifies you this is what saves you this is what gains you uh, favor in heaven but Paul makes it very clear that there is nothing that we can do of our own power to be justified and further he goes on and and while you know predominantly what we heard last night was about uh, fundamental Mormonism, this same concept raises up in the church a lot. And, and I think each of us in some measure has at some points tried to be justified by our behavior. If I could just be good enough, um, you can't be good enough. Let's just put that to rest. 
uh, if we could be good enough, well, let me, let me finish, because Paul actually says what I want to say. So, verse 17, But if, in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. Again, this, this word, certainly not, in the Greek, it, there is no more emphatic word. It, it's the, the, the uh, written form of shouting, No! <laughs> this can't be! And so he says, uh, certainly not, for if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now this last part, this is really where I want to center, but there's... I encourage you, study Galatians. Look at what Paul is saying. He speaks a lot of deep things uh, for faith in this, this book. Uh, but in verse 21, he says, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Amen. And so we need to put to rest this idea that man can do anything to merit God's favor, to merit salvation. Um, last night, this passage was talked about, flip over in Ephesians chapter 2 real quick. We're just going to touch on uh, a, a similar passage, speaking to the same idea, but from a little bit of a different direction. Um, if we could be justified, if we were able to attain righteousness by the law, then Christ died in vain. The cross was utterly useless. So Paul writing to the Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, and he says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Another great passage that he alludes to. He follows this up later in the book, speaking about spiritual warfare. If you don't understand that uh, we are engaged in a war that has gone on since shortly after creation, um, then you really you, you put yourself up for a lot of defeats because we have an, an active enemy that is working in opposition to us, whose sole purpose and, and him and his minions is our utter destruction. Um, verse 3 among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh and carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind okay Paul puts us all in the same boat Jew or Gentile doesn't matter we're all in the same boat pre-Christ we are all in the position where we deserve the wrath of God what differentiates people is that saving faith that we talk about in a, in a few verses. Okay, so, like the rest of mankind, uh, children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God, my two favorite words in the Bible, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Paul is revealing the very heart of God. Okay? We, we talk about the gospel being the good news. And I've... Those of you that attend church here, you know that I say the good news is always predicated on bad news that precedes it. If you are not in trouble, the good news doesn't mean anything to you. If you are not lost, the, the hope of being found doesn't mean anything to you. If you don't understand your condition, your terminal illness, then the cure doesn't mean anything to you. So he's talking about the, the mercy, the grace, and the love of God. Uh, Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, 
not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. <clears throat> now, there is an order. Um, I have a little mathematical formula <clears throat> in these verses that I think lays it out very clear for us. And the formula always starts with grace. <clears throat> Excuse me. God's grace is the beginning of it all. God's grace being motivated by his perfect love, his unconditional love, him choosing to love even though we're not worthy of it. Okay. This is, this is actually the love that Paul refers to a couple chapters later uh, when he's talking about husbands and wives. And he calls husbands to love their wives as Christ has loved the church. Not based on merit or value, but choosing to love. Okay? So this is the kind of love that God is expressing to us. And it's because of this love, he extends to us grace. So grace has to be combined with something for salvation. Grace, and then we see verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace plus faith equals salvation. Nothing can be added. Nothing can alter that equation. Otherwise, that equation becomes null and void. If this equation is grace plus faith divided by or multiplied by works, then the grace is absolutely useless. It's unnecessary. It's not needed. And I think, you know, unfortunately, so many people have heard the song Amazing Grace for so long, we forget what amazing right. grace really is. We forget that grace is something that is an amazing event in our lives. It's an amazing component of God that he extends to us, and, and we've relegated it to a song title. Amazing Grace. Oh, yeah, I know that song. No, 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 you don't understand. Amazing Grace. Grace, And so he says grace uh, and faith <clears throat> equal salvation. But then watch this because he doesn't end right there. Now the, the question of works uh, was obviously was brought up a lot yesterday in, in some of the teaching that we received, some of the testimony that we received that, that uh, it, you had to work to earn God's favor. No one can ever be good enough to merit God's favor. If we could, the cross is null and void. But see what he says here. He says, uh, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. We can't do anything to merit. It's simply because God is good. God is good. Um, I, I use the phrase a lot when people ask me how I'm doing. Uh, I can respond with full confidence regardless of how I feel, regardless of what's going on in my life. I can respond, God is good. Okay? I may not see his goodness in the moment. You may not see his goodness in the moment. But if you know God, you know that he is good. Amen. That his heart towards us is good. That everything that goes on in our life, he intends to bring good out of. So, uh, this is the gift of God, verse 9, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So, if you want to put a parenthetical statement, grace plus faith, and then in this parenthetical statement says, works has nothing to do with this, <laughs> equals salvation, but then look at verse 10. Because, again, it doesn't end just with this equation. In verse 10, he says, because for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. Now, so our formula reads, and, and see, I'm doing it to me. i got to reverse it to you. Grace plus faith, parenthetical statement, works has nothing to do with this, equals salvation, and then arrow unto works. Okay. Now, there are three components that I see in Scripture that reveal the heart of a true believer. Okay. There are three things that, uh, well, four actually, but two of them are kind of tied, tied together. Um, the first thing that we see that when we look at a person, we are not called to judge a person's salvation. We can't do that. 
We don't, we don't have the, the knowledge, we don't have the insight, we don't have the understanding. It's not our place to say, yeah, that person's saved, that person's not saved. What we can do, though, is we can judge the fruit. We can judge the attributes and, and what the character of the person is. And so there are a number of things that we look at. The first thing that we look at, but not the only thing, is we look at the works of the person's life. What are those works unto? And this is not your employment, although it may include your employment. This, this is not your, your volunteer work, although it might include your volunteer work. This is you being active in the things that God has called you to do. The things that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So works are a necessary component of being saved, but not necessary unto salvation. If you are a true believer, works will follow That's right. in some measure. And, and those works are going to be different for you than from you, and you than from you, and you from me. They're, they're going to be different because you, you may not be called to be a mouth. You may be called to be an elbow. You may be called to be a foot. Um, and, and each of us has a different gifting and a different calling. But then there's another component that, that uh, Paul writes about back in Galatians chapter 5. There's fruit. Okay, and Paul, uh, this was discussed a little bit last night. Dora shared with us the works of the flesh. But then Paul goes on and he contrasts them to the fruit of the Spirit. And, and this is fruit that needs to be abundant in our lives. Paul lists them out. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, we are going to excel in these gifts in different measures. I'm going to have gifts that I'm stronger in, the fruit that I'm stronger in, than some that you might have. You are going to have fruit that you're stronger in than some that I have. But Peter makes an interesting statement when talking about this. He says that we have this in increasing measure. Okay? The measure of, of my fruit is not you. The measure of your fruit is not me. The measure is where it is compared to where it was. Okay? Do you have more fruit this year than you had last year? Do you have better fruit this year than you had last year? Is your fruit increasing as you go on? Can you look back over a period of time and, and uh, weeks, months, years, decades? Can you see a progression of the fruit in your life growing more abundantly? So we have works that are, that salvation is under works. As a result of being saved, we have fruit that comes out in our lives. This is the spiritual fruit, a life led by the Spirit, lived by the Spirit. These are attributes that will become uh, apparent in each person's lives. Again, some I, I, I have some of these that I excel at. Uh, there are others that uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't excel as well at. Some of my fruit is a little bit shriveled, but at least I've got it, whereas before I didn't have it, okay? But then there's a third thing that Jesus says, uh, if you are going to be a follower of his, if you are going to acknowledge him as Lord, you have to do what he says. There has to be obedience. Uh, they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, Lord. He said, why do you call me Lord, but you don't do what I say? A true believer is going to obey the commands of God. And again, keep in mind, this is not unto perfection. It's in increasing measure. Because if we could be perfect, we have no need for Christ. Okay? So it's in increasing measure. So your, your measure is not, oh my gosh, I've got to be perfect. You're not going to get there. None of us are going to get there. If we could be there, we had no need for Christ to take our sin upon himself and to impute righteousness to us. Okay, so, and then the fourth thing, and this is the one thing that we don't hear a lot about. Um, uh, when Jesus told the parable of the sower of the seed, the sower went out and he scattered the seed. And he scattered the seed. To me, it sounds uh, very irresponsibly. But if we look at it, we realize it's not irresponsible. It's actually very generously. Because the seed falls on the path. The seed falls in the rocks. The seed falls in the weeds. And the seed falls on good ground. Now, the seed doesn't care where it lands. Its job is to grow. That's its sole purpose, is to grow. That's all the seed's got to do. Okay? The sower is putting the seed, and honestly, 
this being a, an illustration, a parable about us sharing the gospel, we don't always know what the ground is going to look like. Some of the most amazing transformation things that I've seen is I've, I've witnessed people who were horrible people. Now, we're all horrible people, but, but we like to justify, we like to categorize and prioritize and, and put in hierarchy sins. And there are some sinners that are like, well, yeah, that guy, that guy sins. And then there are some sinners like, whoa, wow, that guy, that's a real sinner. God doesn't see it that way, but we do. And, and you seeing, you, I'm not even going to share the gospel. That guy doesn't want the gospel. That guy wants to kill me and eat me. You know, and, but then the spirit has cultivated good soil in that person's heart. And um, seeing people in prison come to faith. Um, and then you, you meet people that, that are good people that their soil is the path or the rocks or the weeds. Now what's interesting is that in three of the soil that the, the seed was cast, plants grew. The seed did what it was supposed to do. It grew. And the rocks, it lacked root. The sun came out and scorched it. It withered and died. In the weeds, it grew up, but then the weeds grew up with it and choked it out. In the good soil, it produced, it reproduced a crop. So this is, this is an illustration of, or a parable of, of the gospel being sent out. But the last thing that Jesus says that is, is a a, a testimony of a person's salvation is they endure. Jesus says that they that endure to the end will be saved. And, and I think we all know people that um, had a testimony of Christ in their life um, and at some point recanted and rejected and turned away. Uh, again, remember, we are not called to make the judgment of their salvation. We're called to judge the fruit of their life. We're called to judge the manner in which they conduct themselves. And so the, 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 the fruit, the seed that grew and produced is the seed that endured. Those are those that endure to the end. Remember, we're running our race as though to win it, that there is, there is for each of us a finish line. And on the other side of that line, if you've ever watched the Boston Marathon or the New York Marathon or any marathon, you, it's amazing to watch when those people cross the line. There are some people that are professional runners, and they cross the line, and they're like, all right, when's the next one? And then there are other people that they're, they're out there, man, they are doing this. This may be the first time they've ever finished a marathon. And when they come across the line, they fall into the arms of the people that are waiting. And I think that's what it's going to be like for the believer. When we cross that finish line, we want to cross that finish line completely spent. And then when we cross that line, we fall into the arms of our Savior. Okay. And that's enduring to the end. Okay. So I, I just want to bring up these couple of points. If righteousness could be attained by the law, the cross means nothing. And so in, in Ephesians, Paul reiterates this to a, a different church, to a different group of people, that salvation is not because of works. It can't because of, be because of works. It has got to be, by God's grace, added to the faith that he gives us. Works has nothing to do with this, but as a result of this, salvation comes, and out of salvation comes works and fruit and obedience and endurance. And so at this point, I'm going to turn this over to you and let you come and share with us what God has given you. Amen? Amen. All right. Galatians were so powerful and I think they are powerful to all those who come out of a works-based religion. Um, grace is so foreign to us, God's grace. Um, so it's really a blessing to, to go through the grace of God and not by works. Um, 
we're grateful again to share this morning uh, an extenuation of what we talked about last night. Uh, we shared the testimony um, and that Karen gave of the manipulations and the coercions uh, that they use, that polygamists use to get submission by females to come into polygamy and to be plural wives. And then, of course, we talked about the history. Why is Mormon polygamy even here today? And why is it such a stranglehold in this culture today? And of course, we know that Joseph Smith is the one who brought it and said, God said, and whenever people say God said, if you don't know your Bible, you're going to fall, or likely to fall for it. So this morning, we're going to talk about some other topics. Again, there's that's our, our purpose of our, our ministry. And worked when we tried it earlier. And there's our webpage. If you want to go to our webpage, shieldandrefuge.org, and on that you can find a lot of information about our ministry, about polygamy, and how to get resources. And this is our media webpage where we've been, since 2008, we've been taping programs talking about polygamy, interviewing people from polygamy, interviewing people from Mormonism, doctrinal issues, and all kinds of news items that takes on with polygamy. So that's a very good place to go as well. This morning I want to talk about who the Savior is according to the Bible, <laughs> because it's different than according to Mormonism or polygamy. Um, when I started putting this together, I thought, well, let's look how many times the word's in the Bible. So I looked it up, and the word Savior is used in the Bible 38 times. The word salvation is used nearly 175 times. The Bible Dictionary defines New Testament salvation as deliverance, preservation, salvation, rescue, safety. It defines Savior as to save, deliver, protect, and preserve. The Old Testament word for Savior is defined as avenge, defend, delivery, help, rescue, save, get victory. How can polygamy do that? And yet they say polygamy will save you. Of course, as Christians, we know that Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, of course, fulfills every aspect of all those definitions to the fullest extent, especially that Jesus is the Savior from sin and death, hell and evil. And as we talked earlier, if you're going to be saved, you're being saved from something. And what are we being saved from? God's wrath against sin. And how can works, how can polygamy or any kind of works erase your sin? They can't. Once you've sinned, that's it. You're done. Now, Mormonism and Mormon fundamentalists acknowledge that Jesus is Savior. They acknowledge that. They agree. They have different definitions, by the way. But then they bring alongside the Savior a string of requirements and ordinances that have to be obeyed in order for him to be able to be the Savior. And it's the same in Mormon fundamentalists as well as is, by the way, the LDS Church. They have requirements as tithing or temple work or, or baptism for the dead or, or whatever so the dead people can have a second chance to get saved and and all of that nonsense. And you have to do that in order to achieve salvation. They also have volumes of other requirements that you don't even want to hear about uh, that the members have to work through in order to attain and make sure that they have eternal life. And then, of course, they believe, too, that you have to endure to the end. But they don't know what that means. They don't even know what it means. Eternal life to the Christian is simple. And when we witness to Mormons or Mormon fundamentalists, keep it simple. That's what we need to do. Don't complicate it. God made it simple. We shouldn't complicate it for him. According to the Bible, there's only two places to go after we die, heaven or hell. And if we're saved, we're saved from hell to go to heaven. According to them, uh, they have all, all kinds of different places to go. They have three heavens, three different heavens. Um, and all of them are better than life on earth. Very few people are ever going to go to outer darkness, and that's their fourth place. But when you get to, when you're a polygamist, you get to go to the highest heaven. But in the highest heaven, they call the celestial glory. They still have three other levels. And and if you're a real good polygamist and become a god, you go to the highest level of the highest level. Now, talk about complicating the simplicity of something that God has revealed to us. So when you hear a polygamist or an LDS person say exaltation, that's very important because that's their celestial glory, which is equivalent to when we Christians say eternal life. It's the same equivalent. But they got that you become a god. 
and that if you're a woman, you become a goddess. Now, according to them, there's no hell, as the Bible describes it. So what are you saved from? If there's no hell, what are you saved from? When you use the word savior or salvation? And that's a good question to ask anyone if you're talking to them. And again, yesterday I said, uh, mentioned that Mormonism teaches that Lucifer and Jesus are spirit brother. But our question is, how can he possibly, how can they possibly be brothers? How can Jesus, who is the creator, be Satan's brother? Isaiah 43, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be after me. I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. You see how he's interchanged? He's God, he's the Lord, he's the Savior. This Old Testament, this isn't a New Testament scripture, this is Old Testament. How can he be Lucifer's brother? God saves, uh, God creates, only God saves, only God creates, and, and Jesus is both creator and savior, so he could possibly be Lucifer's brother. And I ask, sometimes I say, how can Lucifer's brother save anyone? How can he save anyone? Um, and how many saviors are there anyway? And that's part of what I'm going to talk about now, because most everyone will agree that Jesus is the savior, but they don't agree that he alone is savior. And if you can establish that fact in a Mormon or a polygamous mind, you might have their attention. Okay? He alone is Savior. Polygamy cannot help the sinner. Polygamy cannot help the sinner do anything to save themselves because Jesus is the Savior, not polygamy. Now, Mormon polygamy group um, uh, teaches exaltation big time. You'll hear that a lot about being exalted and being exalted, doing temple work, baptizing for the dead, and so on, like I already mentioned. But they complicate their message to make more saviors. And they add to that, by the way. Something, something new will come up, and they'll add to who the savior, who can help save you. The doctrine that they teach is a woman cannot be saved unless she's married. And if she's married, she must be a polygamist. And even if she has passed those requirements, her husband must be pleased with her because if he call, he's the one who calls her from the grave at the resurrection. They've twisted that. So when we all die and end up in the grave and resurrection day comes, if your husband doesn't call you from the grave, you don't get to be resurrected. You're lost. Okay, and the husband has to do it. And if he's not pleased with her here on this planet, he might threaten her, hey, I'll call you up on the resurrection day, you know, and that manipulates her and scares her and threats her, and so she is forced to submit to him. That's a big manipulation in polygamy and in Mormonism. So if it's the husband who saves the wives, that makes them co-savior, doesn't it? Uh, and that, the people who baptize for the dead believe that they're giving the people on the other side who didn't get saved before they died another chance, a second chance to be saved. And so they are called saviors by Mormonism. They call, we are saviors. There's many saviors because they're baptizing for dead people and gives them a chance to get saved. And then, of course, keeping the commandments, obeying the laws and obeying the leaders. Are they the saviors? Are we our own saviors? If, if, we could save, if we could be saved by works, we would be our own saviors. So who's the savior? How dare we call Jesus the savior and then turn around and, and just completely keep him out of the picture when we're talking about how to get saved? In a polygamous marriage, women are, uh, the, the word keep sweet is important, especially with the FLDS, but it is with most of the polygamy groups. So women are supposed to keep sweet. They're supposed to be happy, lay aside all jealousies, be humble, be a doormat, hide your hurts, willingly and joyfully give more wives to your husband with a smile on your face. And all that and more is required for them to qualify for celestial glory. So your attitude becomes part of the salvation experience. And if you don't do those things when Jesus comes back, um, he won't be able to save you. You know, so we've, we've taken the person a savior from the person. They believe that you do, uh, that Jesus does the percent of the work he did on the cross and the rest is up to you. That's right, they do believe that. In fact, the Book of Mormon says, we know we are saved by grace after all we can do. So who's the savior? Polygamists need to hear the true gospel message, of course, the message of grace. And that's, of course, what mission, Christian missions and missionaries and evangelists and children refuge is all about. 
The Bible tells us that Abraham believed God and he counted it to him as righteousness. He believed God. Okay. King James says he believed in God. That's not correct. It's he believed God and he counted it to him as righteousness. Joseph Smith comes along and says Joseph Smith lived polygamy and so God counted it to him as righteousness. Uh, and they believe it's a law, they call polygamy a law, a requirement, an essential, and if all that were true, Jesus Christ died in cross on the cross totally in vain. Is God stupid? That he sent Jesus to die on the cross in vain if we can do it ourselves, or even part of it? All that pain and agony Jesus went through on the cross? I mean, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous to even think about it. Uh, now, we know, of course, that Jesus is, a, is the Savior all by himself, and we want polygamists to know that, and works are not part of it. Now, the, what, the scriptures you just read, I, it's interesting, I had here, um, so we'll just go through them really quickly. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, Christ died in vain. I love this verse, Galatians 5.1, for freedom, Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Freedom sets you free. You said we're free. How, what, what do you call the yoke of slavery in polygamy? Oh, a heavy, such a heavy, heavy burden. Even in Mormon, even in any religion that causes work. And then Galatians 5, 4, you are severed from Christ. Severed, cut. Right. You're cut off from Christ. You who have been justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. So if we want to do the works of the law to achieve, achieve salvation, we've fallen from grace. I want grace. <laughs> I need grace real bad. Um, and so it, uh, it leads us ourselves to earn our own salvation, and we know we can't do that. So polygamists either don't believe it, and I know I've talked to some about grace, and they don't believe it. They just flat don't believe it. Or they don't know it, and sometimes when they find out about it, they are so amazed. They want to know more. The beauty of God's salvation is that Jesus did do it all, and we know that, and we are so grateful. It is finished, and, and polygamists really need to know and understand that. Now, when trying to read with, reason with polygamists using the Bible, I'll ask the question, how many times do you fail to keep all the commandments? They say you have to keep all the commandments. That's part of your salvation, working to salvation. So how many times do you keep them all? The Bible says you have to keep them all, all the time. Not some of them, some of the time and the rest of them at other times, but all of them, all the time. You can't fail once. So how many times do we fail? Well, James 2.10 says, whoever keeps the whole law, that's 10 commandments, that's the law he's talking about, but fails in just one point, is guilty of breaking the whole law. Not just one, but all of them. And then he goes on to explain, you know, the same person who said don't murder is also the same person who said don't commit adultery. So you're sitting against the lawgiver. That's right. Right? So failing once is eternal and permanent failure. So we all need grace. And this is what we need to explain to the people that we talk to from the Mormon church because polygamy cannot change the fact that you failed. They'll never change it. Um, they teach that living polygamy makes us more Christ-like. And this really bothers me. This is one of my pet peeves. This is one of the button pushers for me. Uh, that living polygamy makes us more Christ-like because it requires us to deal with our sinful nature. Because, uh, because we get jealous and we need to learn how to control those jealousies. But isn't that, that whole scenario, inviting temptation into our lives? Um, if, we look, if, if we do evil, put ourselves in an evil situation so we can learn how to resist temptation, there's something wrong there. There's, there's something wrong with that whole scenario. Even in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, this is how you pray, lead us not into temptation. How is God going to lead anybody into polygamy so they can be tempted not to be jealous? That's, that's contradictory. It, it, it goes against what Jesus said. And, and many, many problems, of course, result from polygamy that they don't often talk about. Many of them are sexual sins, extremely bad sexual sins. Uh, because once the boundaries, once the sexual boundaries have been blurred, the, there's not very many boundaries that they have to worry about. And some of them can get pretty well disregarded and eliminated to where almost anything can happen. 
If the sons of a polygamous family, a polygamous father, they watch their father going from woman to woman, what's he going to come grow up thinking? If he sees his mother being treated as a doormat or suffering poverty and suffering abuse uh, and loneliness and neglect and disrespected, won't he do the same thing when he matures? He'll do what he sees his father do and how his father treats those women. And they teach and they preach, this really bugs me too, they, uh, sexual purity for the female. You have to be a virgin when you get married. But the male gets to mess around with multiple females. And it's the males who are raping the daughters and, they, and their female cousins and sisters. So what happens? They, they make it impossible for her to be uh, pure when she gets married. And then when you get married, you're not pure, then, then you're castigated. So you, there's no winning in any of this for the female. Many of the organizations that help people from polygamy, and I'm talking also about our own, people that we've helped out of polygamy, at least 90% of them have been sexually abused. That's huge. They've been molested or raped, repeatedly raped, gang raped, most often by family members, boys as well as girls. Now I'm going to recite some examples. If some of you if this bothers you, then you might want to leave. If you're sensitive to this kind of thing, you might want to walk away for this part of the talk because I'm going to be, tell you some of the things that's happened. And I'm going to begin with the, the FLDS, Warren Jeffs group. I don't know if you're very familiar with him, um, but you'll know a lot more about him by the time we're finished here. He's the former and leader of the prophet of the FLDS polygamy group. I'm going to picture of some of his wives. He loved the young girls, the young, young, young brides. He had at least 80 wives at the same time. He was honored by his people as a holy man, and his people considered him God's mouthpiece on earth. Of course, they call him the prophet, but they're not a prophet at all. He's currently serving a life plus 20 years in a Texas prison for rape and sexual assault of a 12-year-old girl. Home base for the FLDS for years is the Hilldale, Colorado City community. Uh, however, God's got greater control of that, that yeah. community now, and there's Christian ministries all over the place down there, and, and most of the FLDS who left Warren Jeffs is gone. But that's where they were situated, the home base is where they were situated. I want you to kind of imagine yourself in this little story I'm gonna tell you, um, if you can kind of get into the situation. Uh, to, about one 18-year-old uh, girl, she said, um, early one morning, imagine this, you're 18 years old and early one morning your father rolls you out of bed and tells you to get ready because you're going to go for a drive and you know, somehow you know that it's going to be a life-changing situation that you're facing. It doesn't feel very good, but you obey because you're always taught to obey your leaders and your parents. And as you drive away, your father tells you, I turned you in this morning. You know what that means. It means that he has given you as a plural wife to the leader of the group, Warren Jeffs. So you get in the car and you drive away. You drive all day long. It's in a secret location. It's dark when you get there. Walk up to the door, led into a waiting room, and after a long wait, you're escorted into another room, and there's Warren Jeffs waiting for you. And he interviews you, talks to you for a minute, just a few minutes, and when you're done with that, he calls in a couple of witnesses, and they marry you to him on the spot and you just become his 65th wife. Now that happened to a woman that we helped out of the FLDS polygamy group several years ago. And she said this about the ceremony. Don't let anybody ever tell you it's free, that, that women have a choice. After we both said yes, there was a quick kiss and then everyone was sent out of the room. I was completely silent, more scared than ever. I held conflicting feelings about Warren Jeffs. I didn't like him, but I knew I was supposed to admire and honor him. He said, come, sit on my lap. I did as I was told. What else could I do? Then he began touching me all over, my hair, my face, my shoulders, stomach, and lower. I was frozen and sat perfectly still. I think some part of me had blanked out. And then he called my father back in the room and told him, take her home, she isn't ready yet. Until years later, I did not realize that being sent home without consummating the marriage was punishment. <laughs> it was really a relief for her at the time, you know. But yeah. she said, later she said, that's the best punishment I ever had. 
she did blank out. She had mental problems, severe mental problems for years after that. Warren Jeffs taught his people that polygamy is the way of the gods, that polygamy is lived in heaven. They had a ranch down at the El Dorado, Texas, the, the FLDS ranch down there, um, called the Yearning for Zion, and it was raided by the, the local authorities in 2008, and they confiscated a million documents uh, from their temple, and it included diaries and marriage records where uh, they use later as evidence against Warren Jeffs because he chronicled all of his illegal underage marriages. The evidence included a tape recording of his assault on a 12-year-old girl while some of the wives restrained her and watched. Now, Jeffs had a bed made in their temple especially for this purpose. And he said, when I need it, I will pull it out and set it up. The bed will be a size big enough for me to lay on. I will be covered with the sh it will be covered with the sheet, but it will have a plastic cover to protect the mattress from what will happen on it. He has set up a deliberate rape bed. This is the, the bed that he raped that 12-year-old girl and that he was sent to prison for. He did it to more than one, but it was only one that they needed to convict him. So they only did it with one. And then in his trial, the members of the jury heard a tape recording that he had made of that rape and were brought to tears. The jury was brought to tears when they had to listen to that as evidence. And this is the 12-year-old girl that you can see uh, that he did that. He, he said in uh, one of his journal entries that they found, he said, if uh, the world knew what I was doing, they would hang me from the highest tree. He did things that we're not even going to talk about because they're so gross. He knew what he was doing was wrong. He knew it. But he told all of his people it was God's desire. Um, I want to quote from a young boy who grew up in the FLDS polygamy group. He caught Warren Jeffs' attention. He wrote a book after he escaped the FLDS, Brad Jeffs, and this is what he said. Warren quietly grabbed my hand and led me into a bathroom. Two of Warren's brothers were there, and one of them closed and locked the door. They stood as if they were standing guard. Warren brought me over by the tub. He knelt down so he could see my face. He said that God had chosen him to help me become a man and that what was about to happen was God's will for me. This is how a boy becomes a man, he stressed. This is God's work. His voice is calm, but then he got colder and sharper. You cannot tell anyone or say anything to anyone because this is between you and God. If you do tell, you will burn in hell. And then he describes how Warren Jeffs rapes him. Many people, many children grow up in polygamy and they're scared to death of God. Any wonder? You wonder about that? Because all that they know about him is that he's terrifying and cruel and inflicts great pain for his pleasure. And that's the Red Jeffs. I, by the way, I interviewed you on my program years and years ago. And he hates the Lord. He hates God. He hates religion, anything, because he believes what Warren Jeff said that God wanted this to happen. It was between him and God, and God required it. Is there any reason that any, he can't even, he can't even have to wonder why they leave polygamy and want to throw out the baby with the bathwater? A couple of years ago, a lawsuit was filed in Utah alleging that FLDS men have historically sexually abused and assaulted underage girls. One accuser said the rituals took place five or six times a week. From the time she was eight years old, they would put a sack over her head and take her to an unknown location where she was assaulted. When she got to be 14 years old, uh, she was forced to watch and document while other girls, while this took place with other girls, ritualistic abuse by the FLDS church leaders. And she was warned that if she told anyone about what was going on, that God would destroy her and her family immediately. And if she cried during the ritual, God would destroy her and punish her. Fear. Can you imagine? The ugly fear all of this puts in these little children. These are kids. You know, I often think of what Jesus said, if you hurt one of my little ones, it would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown the bottom of the ocean. Well, that's what's going on here. This particular lawsuit hasn't come to trial yet. It's kept highly secretive. And I wonder if it ever will actually now. 
almost everyone who escapes from polygamy have a real tough time trusting anything religious. Uh, and so if you're ever working with a polygamist, you have to be very sensitive to that fact because it's very, very true. And I can, I can tell you from my own experience, I, had, I didn't trust anything that had to do with religion. Don't talk to me about God. I don't want you to tell me anything about the Bible. Forget that because I thought that God was responsible for all this ugly doctrine. And you know, what's interesting too is when you, if you mentor any of these folks, and by the way, this can apply to people from the LDS church as well, but it's more, uh, it's more deeply ingrained in the, in the polygamous group. But they, if they contemplate leaving, if they're thinking of leaving or trying to leave, the devil will come against them. And they will cause all kinds of, ha he'll cause havoc in his, their lives. I've seen it happen many, many times. And they will do whatever they can. Fear and guilt and coercion and shame or accidents, physical problems, whatever it takes to keep them in bondage to the false religion. And then if they do get out, the devil will keep you from wanting God. They'll do everything they can because the devil doesn't care what lie you believe as long as you don't believe the truth. That's why so many of them, when they do leave, they'll go to the Mormon church, or they'll go to witchcraft, or they'll go to some other false religion or atheism, because he doesn't care what lie you believe. Just don't get to the truth, and he'll keep you from it. And our mission is to fight Amen. against that very actions of the devil, to bring them the biblical truths of the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Another group, Jim Hormston. Yeah, um, he was the leader of the true and living church of Jesus Christ of Saints of the Last Days. That was the name of his group. And it was based in Manti, Utah. He was the founder and he called, called himself a prophet. He died a few years ago. And he died of a heart attack because he took too much Viagra. And this is not a lie. This is the truth because he had to sustain his sexual activity with both old and young brides. He was uh, very, very coercive. He threatened hellfire and damnation to anybody who dared to disagree with him or refuse his advances. He wrote a letter to one of his youngest brides. She was 43 years younger than him. He threatened her with fire and brimstone because she refused to sleep with him. Now, that's kind of gross, isn't it? Um, and he told her that he, she was going to have a lonely and miserable life in this world for not coming to bed with him. She, he, he wrote her a letter, and this is part of what he wrote. The facts are, whether you want to believe or not, the end is coming and judgment will be executed in severity, especially for those who have broken their covenants. For certain, I will deal with you in the future eternity. He signed his letter, your husband, king, and priest, and then he sent copies of it to 18 of his wives and one of those 18 wives was this girl's mother. Now, her name was Pauline. Pauline later said this. Oh, no, that was the, that was the, the bottom one. She later said this. Nobody would help me. Everyone was scared of Jim. He got up in church and said if any wife disobeyed him, he would send her to hell for a thousand years. He also said that because of my actions, my baby daughter would have to die by some natural cause or accident to save her soul. That's the threats they use. And they do it. I heard all kinds of threats like that when I was growing up. I wasn't in that situation, but you still get the same threats. I met Pauline later, um, and later her, her daughter was able to get away. But I met Pauline. She became a Christian. She was hurt bad by Jim Harmston. She got caught cancer and died a few years after I had met her. But I spent some time with her down in Manti one time having a talk. She loved the Lord. Praise God that people do get out. Now we're going to look at the Kingston group. That's the group I came from. They're disgusting. Uh, it's ironic that most polygamists demand morality. Uh, from their members, but like I said again, but the men don't, they can sleep with all these women, but women can't with the men. Incest is, is a doctrinal principle in the Kingston polygamy group. They teach that Jesus was married and lived polygamy, and that the Kingston family is a direct bloodline from one of Jesus's plural wives. And so y'all, everybody has to have pure Kingston blood flowing through their veins in order to be eligible to be saved. 
Okay? So what happens when you have to have the same blood? You start marrying siblings, aunts and nieces and uncles and cousins and so on. They do it. They're in their third and fourth generation now of inbreeding. But incest causes deformities. I need to go back because we're not doing that one yet. Incest causes all kinds of deformities. Some, um, some of the men tell their wives that the reason that their wife, that she had a deformed baby, is because they've not been obedient to him, submissive enough to him, as the wife should be, and that healthy births will result just as soon as she starts being a better wife and more submissive to him. Now she's had this, she's had this visual proof uh, of a deformed baby from incest. The only reason, of course, is incest. But now she's got visual proof of her of, of her disobedience to her husband. So she lives in all that shame. She lives in all that guilt. They're so manipulated. And, and then they become robots, robotic, robotically obedient and submissive to the inhumane treatment that the, the husband will give her. And they, they work and use guilt and shame and threats and all kinds of ugly things emotionally. You, you're emotionally dead most of the time. People in polygamy can be emotionally dead through all of these things. Um, I, I wish I could say this was true. I could tell you some of the deformities they've had, but it would gross you out, so I won't. But they do happen, and we all know that incest does that, so that's enough said. A few years ago, a young man from the group, and that's what this next one is, wrote this cry for help. Now, this is a young man. He said, the last six years of my life has been a nightmare. I saw their deep, dark secrets. I experienced physical abuse abundantly and emotional abuse. I left twice in the night, but got so scared I was going to hell for leaving. I returned home next morning. No one in my family found out. I am stuck. My number one wish is to leave. I thought if I waited out until I'm older, I might be able to be strong enough and just leave. As time goes on, it's getting harder to leave. And if I do, I won't see my family or my friends ever again. I'll be alone in a world I know nothing about. The way I see it is I have three choices. Stay in the group and be faithful so that I can have my family. Kill myself and I won't have to worry about any of it anymore. Leave and go to hell and have no family. What should I do? How do all of you ex-members do it? I'm begging for advice on what I should do. I have already turned to God and he hasn't answered anything. If this is really the place I'm supposed to be, I will put all that I am into it. What? should I do? Oh boy, I cried for that young man. I talked to him, I ministered to him, told him the gospel. He was so afraid. He, he, I, I, can't, I can't even explain to you how frightened he was. He was afraid uh, to even meet with me because he was afraid he'd be found out and then he would be abused, accused. It's awful. And he's still in the group. He hasn't left. In a few years. Another escapee at age 15 wanted out of the Kingston group. She's the fifth of her mother's 12 children. Her father's 14 wives. She hated polygamy from the day she knew that that's what it was. And so at 15 she ran away from home. She wound up in a foster home and then was returned later to her mother. Her parents uh, placed her in what they call a repentance home which is, this is their own home, it's not a public home at all. And there she wasn't allowed to communicate with anyone without supervision. It was a virtual prison. The doorknob to her room was taken off the door. She was locked in. She was forced to fast and pray and read the Bible. She wasn't allowed to leave the house until she decided who she would marry. Because when you get married, you can't run away. You know, you get pregnant and then you're stuck. So that's what they had to do. 15 years old. No wonder they have no respect for the Bible, for, for male authority. No wonder when women leave, they turn to feminine power because they have been so abused and submitted, uh, submissive, forced submission all their lives. It's a, it's a terrible thing, and you can find these things in polygamy all the time. I wish I could say these were isolated cases. They're not. They happen every day in all of the Mormon polygamy groups. The Kingston group has mandatory marriage classes for females and they're required to attend them starting at age 11. One lady uh, came to me from the Kingston group explaining a gang rape she had suffered 
when she was just a young girl. And one of the, nothing ever happened to the, to the guys, and one of them was, uh, the Rachel was one of the leaders of the group. Another leader, now this one might gross you out. Another leader raped his three-year-old daughter, and she, he ripped her so badly, they were afraid to take her to the doctor for fear of legal ramifications. Of course, of course, should have been. So his brother, he called his brother, who is the leader of the group, and he came and sold her up at home. And now she's known, I don't know how she survived it, but now she's known as that little girl who had that horrible bicycle accident. She's, she's totally maimed. When I found out about it, I called the police. I called the Salt Lake City Police. They said, you gotta call the county police. I called the county police. They said, you gotta call the sheriff's office. I called the sheriff's office. They said, you have to call the Salt Lake City Police. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, why don't you call the South Salt Lake Police? So I called them, I talked to a lady, I told her about it again. She said, oh, that can't have happened. That I said, would you invest, at least investigate it? Well, I don't know. And I said, come on, you've turned, you put me in the cycle here to elbow all the police departments. Nobody wants to touch it. Why? What about this poor little girl? She says, well, what I'll do is I'll just put it in the records and then if something comes up in the future that we need to refer to it, we'll have it there. Isn't that awful? Three-year-old girl. Another one. The spiritual abuse is from polygamous wife. Spiritual abuse to me was bad. My husband would tell me that I was not worthy enough to get close to the Lord. After 12 years of marriage, he decided he was going to get another wife. The girl he chose to marry was only 14 years old, and my husband wanted her. The problem was, I didn't agree. He told me that he was going to marry her anyway. Either I supported her or not. It was still going to happen, and it did. I had no choice in the matter. I've been married for 30 years and endured spiritual abuse for the first 25. It got so bad. I felt so worthless for so long that I attempted suicide twice. Thank goodness I wasn't successful. I am always wondering if I'm any good. I know that the Lord loves me, but I have a hard time loving Him because I was taught that the Lord would bless me and protect me if I obeyed my husband and He would damn me if I don't. It's hard to get past that. She got out, by the way. Mothers, by the way, who leave polygamy have a real tough time. They, they have to leave without much more than the, you know, a couple of dollars in their purse and the clothes on their back. And then the father of the polygamy group itself tries to keep the children. And court cases can often follow. And they have the money, the, the mother doesn't, and they often win the custody of the children. And then the children then become assets of the polygamy group. And they grow up supporting the group and also uh, having children and then making the group larger and more powerful. Many, many women who leave polygamy won't have as much as a high school education. Some of them do, uh, there's a lot of them who don't, and so they're not equipped to go out and get a job and support themselves. And this is where we come along beside them. We'll come along beside them and help them economically if we can, as much as we can, and, and have, find resources and whatever we can to do to help them. Uh, now we're gonna go to the All Red Polygamy Group and uh, talk about some of the things that they do. It, it, and this is the Pinesdale community. They call it the AUB or the All Red Group. Uh, previous leaders of the All Red Group molested their daughters. Uh, some of them married girls as young as 15 years old. Many abuses are reported to the leaders but never dealt with, and Karen's got a lot of stories about that. Um, uh, there's even fewer, fewer abuses are reported from polygamy groups because polygamy is illegal and and they're afraid they're gonna get caught and they can't file it, they can't bring a, a charges against anybody until there's somebody that's gonna come and file a complaint. And so abuses just don't get uh, reported. A high councilman of the group is charged with four counts of sexual abuse against 10 children. Four of them were not his children. In most of the cases, the children were asked to join him in his bedroom when his four wives were not around. The abuses typically began at seven years old and continued until the girls got married. And if a girl got pregnant, they had an isolated place they would send her until she gave birth, and then she could come back and nobody would know. Uh, polygamous men, like I said, will require sexual purity. One guy from the FLES had like 
seven wives and 50 kids or something like that. And he said, he quoted in an article, we want to marry women who are pure. Who wants to take a, a, a non-pure woman to your bed? And here he is with seven wives. And, and he, he's not pure for her. Why does she have to be pure for him? Now, I'm not talking against sexual purity. I think that we should all wait until we're married before we do stuff like that. But the point is the hypocrisy, the contradiction in, in the male-female relationships in polygamy. Uh, a high councilman of the AUB was said to have set up a torture enterprise in Oregon with another councilman in the 1960s where they molested and physically abused young children. He preached from the pulpit that God asked him to mate with his own daughters. And I talked to somebody from up here in Hamilton one time where he witnessed some of this abuse, this ritual abuse they did to these children. He told me about it. It brought him to tears just talking about it. Now, when he says that God told him to marry his own daughters, he used Lot, Abraham's nephew of the Bible, as a biblical example. Again, there's the misuse of the Bible. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean God wants you to do it, for heaven's sakes, but that's what he's done. And that's what he, the example he used. And then, um, another member of the group was charged with four counts of child rape, three counts of child sodomy, and one count of having sex with stepdaughters. Many polygamous communities are isolated out, and, and so they don't have any, uh, you know, anybody to watch, any watchful care really over the children, and so they have greater opportunity for this kind of behavior, never to get caught. <laughs> And they believe, by the way, that God is the literal father of all human beings, of all humanity. He's the literal father, having sex somewhere in eternity with his several wives. And, and so the spirit children are born. And then when, when we come here, born into a body, that's the spirit children from Heavenly Mother and Heavenly Father. And then God the Father came down and had literal sex with Mary to produce Jesus, to get her pregnant with Jesus. So we have incest right there in their doctrine. It's just built right into it. So you don't have to go very far when you've got bad doctrine. Bad doctrine produces bad behavior. A cry for help from one of the AUB people said, went like this. It was a community in Wyoming. He, she said, what kind of a God makes you do things you know are wrong? Sometimes I just wish I could leave and go straight to hell. It's easier, and at least then I don't have to die inside. I hate my life. I tried to get a hold of her, tried to see what I could do, and I got no response whatsoever. Some people say, leave polygamists alone. They're adults. What they do in their own bedroom is their business. We don't need to get involved with it. Just leave them alone. Some people say polygamy is a victimless crime. Oh, it's against the law. Where you go? But polygamists are encouraged to have a baby a year, give birth to a baby a year. I just told the pastor earlier this morning, there's people in the Kingston group, women who've had 17 kids, 16, 17 kids. And, 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 and how many women does it take to have that many kids a year before pretty soon you've got a lot of kids in a polygamy group? It's not just about adults. And those kids are victimized all the while they're growing up. Now this, I don't want to say everything is like this in every polygamy group because there are pockets of, of, and families that's more abusive than others, obviously. That's the case. And of course, polygamists use the, bus, just, the Bible to justify their polygamy. I want to quote here uh, from Leviticus. Maybe you're aware of, aware of these or not. I don't know. But very quickly, Leviticus 18.6. None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. Uh, you shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. You shall not take her son's daughter, daughter's daughter, to uncover her nakedness. They are relatives. It is depravity. And you shall not take a woman as a rival wife to her sister, uncovering her nakedness while her sister is still alive. And we all know, should know, that uncover nakedness is, is promiscuity, sexual promiscuity, incest, adultery, uh, all the sexual misbehaviors is included in that phrase. But Mormon polygamists do these things. They use the Bible to justify their polygamy, but they don't use the Bible to, 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 to follow the guidelines on how to do polygamy if they insist upon doing it. They do have sex with their children and their in-laws and rival wives and mothers and daughters and blood sisters and siblings. It's just horrible. Um, verse 18, of course, prohibits a man from marrying sisters 
uh, which most polygamy groups, um, I helped one woman out, and her husband married every one of her sisters. I think he had five wives, and every one of them were her sisters. Um, they claim that, that if these sisters are agreeable, it's not rivalry. But there's not one polygamous marriage, not one polygamous marriage, where at some time, some wife is going to be deprived of something because the husband can't do everything, and the other wife gets what she's deprived of. That's rivalry right there. Right there, that's rivalry. And just that very simple thing, not to mention many, many other ways you can explain it as rivalry. So they just use um, totally useless arguments against what the Bible teaches. One more thing before we leave Leviticus 18, something that is extremely important and deadly. Uh, the ancient Israelites obviously had adopted the ways of the nations around them. And God condemned them, told them, you should not be like the nations around you. Don't do these things. That's what they're doing. And so I want to quote Leviticus 18, 24 through 25, as God explains why you don't do these. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things. For by all these, the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean, and the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. Why aren't they afraid to do these things if God will vomit them out of the land if they do? He did it then. He's the same God today as he was then. It's very, it's very, it's damnable, the things that they're doing. And, and of course, God said not to practice polygamy when he said don't commit adultery. You know, so, I mean, before I wrap this up, I, I just wanted to briefly share something that's a little more uplifting <laughs> about some of the ladies that we've helped. We helped a young woman who had escaped her father's uh, promiscuous attempts to uh, bring his family under the mantle of Christian polygamy. She was from Canada, and her, husband, her father had been very, very disruptive in this area with the family. And she came to Utah and she contacted our ministry for help. We placed her and her three children in a Christian host home. And as always happens, those who escape polygamy, have a, they go through an emotional time. There's a period of time of darkness, of, of pain, confusion, and shame, and bitterness, and anger. I mean, it can be all sorts of emotions these women go through as they are trying to get out of this mindset they've been brainwashed into. But the couple that took the, her into, three kids, three kids, and took her into her home, the couple, uh, full of grace, I mean, they were awesome, just so great. They, they showed God's grace and patience and understanding. And, and after she had passed the critical point uh, of her exiting process, she wondered why people in the polygamy culture do what they do and lie about God when they know they're lying about God. And she wrote me this personal note. She said, I don't understand why so many people can get away with being the complete opposite of what the Bible teaches. When the Bible's so clear that what they believe is wrong. They twist so many verses. Is it all about power, Doris? Don't they really want to be in heaven too? Do they just need to control us? The Bible gospel is so simple and beautiful. I feel like I stepped into this life I dreamed of. Often I listen and can barely talk because I'm scared I'll start to cry if I do. Living with this Christian couple is like I have these parents that totally care. I can ask them questions about what I had previously been taught, and they are so patient to explain stuff to me. I'm going to try and read this whole Bible from the beginning to the end. I really want to know how my father can present himself as being a Christian and yet do all that he's done. I just want to know the truth about God without living in fear to do it. And she did. She's thriving now. She went to Canada, and she's thriving now as a Christian. And you know, we think it's bad here religiously. Go to Canada, it's worse. So she's, she's facing, but God's really got his grip on her. The very first rescue, we actually rescue people so when we need to, took place within a few days back in 2007 when we first set up our, our website. And it came from a woman, um, that woman there standing with me. Um, she had read our web page and she called to, uh, she had read our website and she wanted me to explain why polygamy wasn't right, why, why wasn't it God's will. And I explained, and she was about half convinced. 
And I invited her to call me and talk to me anytime that she wanted to. And a few days later, she did. She called and told me that she was a prospective plural wife. She'd been living in this home with the AUB group, by the way, in Draper. And, and she was their nanny. I think his wife had uh, two or three kids. And she was their nanny. So she was learning what it was like to live in their home. And then one day, they would get married. And be, she'd be a polygamous wife. Uh, so she'd been properly groomed and brainwashed to believe that polygamy was was a, a good thing, but what's really odd is she had gone to Christian Bible College. Um, and evidently, they, there's some stuff they didn't teach them, but she was hoodwinked into believing Mormon polygamy was okay. But as the nanny to the children of this prospective plural family, he had become autocratic, dictate, which the men do, and abusive and physically, she, he had hit her. He started physically abusing her. And I told her, once they start that and you let them get by with it, it doesn't stop, it gets worse. Oh, he'll get better when he get, and no, it'll get worse. And so she finally decided she wanted us to help her. And we made the plans. The couple there, that lower picture, offered her their host of a home a host home for her. We went down and I told, we made the plans. She was going to uh, pack her bags and put them on the front porch. We would call her when we got down there uh, on her cell phone. And she would go out on the porch. We'd grab her in the bags and be gone. And we did. They never knew. They never knew what happened to her. He, she called him the next day and says, I'm not ever coming back. He says, where are you? And she says, I'm not telling you. And he says, I'm going to find out where you are. And when I do, I'm going to come up and cut off your head. For daring to leave me. Did they ever do that? <laughs> okay, that's another one we helped. Here's another one. Rachel. She called me when, uh, and asked what I could do to help her. She had the polygamous husband uh, who had three wives. He had had four, but he had hurt one so bad she ran away. Uh, she had three little girls, and she's working two or three jobs to support herself because the men do not support the wives. And he was extremely abusive, oppressive, and neglectful. So we made secret plans to help her out. We made sure we didn't email. We didn't talk on the phone uh, unless we could get a phone that wasn't that include her cell phone that he might be listening in. We made the plans. We called the sheriff's department, told him what I was going to be doing the next day on a Saturday morning. Got a truck from people who offered to help to, to unload her good thing, her goods, and, and get her out. And we had plans all made. I sent an email Friday night and said, everything's ready for tomorrow. You know, that's all I said, no, no details. But her husband had been, had hacked into her email account and he did see that email. She called me Friday night before we were ready to go. And she said, I can't go. And I said, why? He saw that email. He went got a restraining order against me, the judge. It was five o'clock Friday night. There's nothing she could do till Monday morning. So we couldn't help her get out Saturday morning because she would not leave without her kids. So we had to call off the whole thing. And, um, and later she was able to get out. Later she got the court behind her to, to, so that she could have primary custody of the kids and she got out. But the, the custody battle turned into an ugly, ugly fight. He fought for those girl, three little girls and he had the money of the group behind him. The judge, he lied in court. I was there, I heard him, he lied under oath perjury. The judge knew it, he was abusive. The judge knew it, he was a polygamist against the law. The judge knew it, and he, she still gave the kids to him. It was an ugly, ugly time. We need better judges. If you have pray for polygamists, pray for legal justice and lawyers and judges who care about the women. Unfortunately, money talks. Her mother, on the far one there, that's Rachel and her mother, uh, supported Rachel leaving, but she was the, she's the one that, that her husband's married to all her sisters. Um, she says, well, polygamy is not the problem, and she, you know, so. but two or three years later, she wanted out. And so we helped her, and she got out, and she said she's faced so much because she had no education and so on like that. But that's what we're here for, is to help. Uh, people that can't help themselves when they get out. And of course, with God's, God's grace, we can do it. We got a call from a pastor in Mexico who had set up a Christian ministry in the LeBaron Polygamy Group down in Mexico. And uh, a woman with three children wanted out. And so she, he called me and said, how can you help her? Can you help her? So we made plans uh, to get her to Phoenix. And then we flew her up 
from Phoenix to Salt Lake, and we met her at the airport, and another woman who gave a host home to her uh, met us there and took her several miles north of Salt Lake City into her host home. Now, as always the case, she, this woman also went through some very tough, hard, dark times um, as she transitioned out of the LeBaron polygamy group. Very sweet woman. Her kids were so delightful, so sweet. And she went through that dark time. We helped her. Christians come alongside her. The host home helped her. And she got through it. And now she's a thriving mother, a thriving Christian. The kids are growing up in a Christian church. So they're physically, mentally, and spiritually free now in Jesus. Um, so it's just one of those, you know, this is just a few of the ways that we help people. Um, when, when Mormonism became... Uh, when they went polygamist, they, more and more the the, the the pool of young women diminished because they all took up, were taken up as brides as, or, or marriageable women, so they had to go to younger and younger women, which is what they have been doing ever since. I'm going to close with a book written by one of Brigham Young's wives who was abused and neglected. She wrote a book after she got away from Brigham Young. Her name was Anne Eliza Young. And um, she wrote a book called Wife Number 19, The Story of a Life in Bondage. And she dedicated her book to polygamous women in Utah. She said, as long as God shall spare my life, I shall pray and plead for your deliverance from the worst than Egyptian bondage in which you are held. You are despised, maligned, and wronged, kept in gross ignorance of the great world outside. You have been led to believe that the noblest nation on earth is but a horde of miscreants and that everyone outside of your own church is your enemy and plotting your destruction. This was written in 1875. It's just as true today as it was then. And, and it's, it's, it's odd that it's gotten worse and not better. And uh, we were, of course, taught the outside world hated us. And then she writes later on in the book, and you happier women, you to whom life is given of its best. She left Utah and went out to, and throughout America and talked to groups of people about Mormon polygamy because America did not know. It was a new country, kind of, you know, at that time. And they didn't know what was going on in Utah. And she says, can you not help me? The cry of my suffering and sorrowing sister sweeps over the broad prairies and asks you, as I ask you now, can you do nothing for us? Women's pens and women's voices pleaded earnestly and pathetically for the abolition of slavery. Thousands of women, some of them your countrywomen and your equals in moral and intellectual worth, are held in a more revolting slavery today. The polygamous women system that blights every woman's life who enters it ought not to remain a curse and a stain upon this nation any longer. It should be blotted out so completely that even its foul memory should die. And it has not been blotted out. Sad. Still a stronghold. How can you help? She says, can you not help me? How can we help? This afternoon we're going to talk about that. If you want to come, we're going to come. It's, not, it's going to be informal discussion, round table kind of thing, where we can talk about how we can help these people. God loves them more than we do. Amen. And he wants that. But he uses people to help people. And he does the miracles as we do the work. So come this afternoon and talk about some of the things that we can do to help and the problems that they face. Prayers, prayers, Amen. prayers are so important. Um, so, so now we, uh, again, there's resources over there for you to take. We're going to take a 10 minute break uh, if you need to break. And then we're going to hear Karen Bradshaw uh, come and share her testimony of being a plural wife in the AUB polygamy group.